Good morning. Let me just say thank you for joining our online experience today. If you've been visiting with us through our online experience, we're so glad uh, that you've been a part of it. And when we get ready to come back to uh, church service, we'd love for you to come and, and join us on Sunday mornings. But church family, let me just remind you of a couple of things. This coming Wednesday night, we'll have business meetings. So just want to remind you of that. Also, starting tomorrow, uh, the 27th at 5.30, our kids will be a part of a virtual uh, vacation Bible school. And so, uh, if you have not signed your child up for the vacation Bible school starting tomorrow, we want to encourage you to go online. Andy will post again to our Facebook page. And so, we want you to just check out the details for them to be a part of that experience. Let me just say that we are so excited about the potential of opening up in just a few weeks. Uh, let me just tell you what's going to happen because hopefully this week or this past week, you received a call from somebody in the church. Um, if you did not receive a call, we just ask that you call the church because our plans are to reopen on August the 16th. And so if you're planning on being here so that we can make preparations for you, We'd ask that you just call the church office and tell us how many in your family are going to come and be a part of that service. Uh, but let me just say the week before, uh, we're going to be doing a trial run with some of our deacons and staff here. And um, so we're making preparations so that when you come in, you won't have hopefully any concerns. And we've already given you the guidelines for when you return. So we ask that you just read those um, and be prepared to worship the Lord Jesus Christ together as a church family. I can't wait for that particular day to come. Uh, let me just say this, as we go in our time of prayer, we've been walking through the Lord's Prayer, model prayer that the disciples had asked for, and Jesus said in this petition, he said, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I mean, one of the things that you experience as a follower of Jesus Christ is that you have been forgiven greatly by your Lord and Savior. And in return, he's calling us to be gracious towards those who offend us, those that hurt us. And so today, as we go to the Lord in prayer, we're going to thank him for his grace and his forgiveness of our sins. But maybe there's somebody that God brings to your mind that, that has offended you, and, and you need to extend that same grace to them. And so as we pray this morning, just ask the Lord to, to lead you, to guide you, to prepare your heart to worship him this morning. So let's pray. Father, again, thankful for this opportunity that we have together this morning by internet and by YouTube, Facebook. And God, I just pray right now that you would just bless our time together, especially as we go into a time of worship. I pray that we sing with our hearts and our minds and our souls, strength, everything that we have uh, to glorify and honor you. And then as we get into your word that's being preached, I, I pray that we listen carefully to, to what you would show us and what you would have us to learn and what we ought to experience out of that. But God, as we spend time in prayer, and we've been walking through the Lord's Prayer, we, we, we pray this petition that, that we are grateful for your forgiveness. We're grateful for your grace that you would save a sinner like us who is broken, who has rebelled against you, God, that you offer us forgiveness free of charge through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And God, as followers of Jesus Christ, I, I pray that we too, if there's somebody in our lives that have offended us or hurt us or caused brokenness in our hearts, God, that we too would extend that same grace, that same forgiveness towards those individuals. So God, we're so thankful for every blessing, every gift that you give us, because we know that all good gifts come from above. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's sing a medley of three great hymns. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood 
What a peace is mine, leading on the everlasting arms. Leading, leading, safe and secure from all alarms. Leading, leading, leading on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? Secure from all alarms, leading, leading, leading on the everlasting arms. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on high. feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on Searching. 
me go ahead and invite you, if you will, open your Bibles to Acts 9. Acts 9. Let me just say that as we turn to Acts chapter 9, this has definitely been a very strange season of life. I mean, nobody really put on our calendar 2020 pandemic. We didn't think about the COVID-19 virus that has literally not only swept our country, but literally swept around the world. And so hopefully things are starting maybe to level off, or at least that's my prayer, and that we eventually find a vaccine and maybe a cure or God just eradicate this virus altogether. But let me just say this, that with this virus, we know that there are symptoms or signs that will come on to let you know that you have basically contracted our, this particular virus. I mean, it's just like cold season or flu season when we're in the middle of winter, because for me, it's, it's like you start with that little scratchy throat, maybe a little drainage out of your nose and and that little achy feeling that you feel in your body you know it's coming on there are certain things that you kind of look for and you know is actually going to happen and so this morning we're going to see the symptoms that will literally take place in your life when God begins to work to transform you by his grace and to draw you to his kingdom and so this morning I've titled the message the conversion of a sinner In fact, Warren Wiersbe, writing on that particular passage we're going to look at in just a moment, he said, perhaps the greatest event in church history, aside from the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, was the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Johnny Hunt, who now works for the North American Mission Board, said, Christianity has never had a more dangerous enemy than Saul of Tarsus or a more dedicated friend than the Apostle Paul, and both are the same man. So this morning, we're going to walk kind of rapidly through this passage. And at the end of it, I I just want to give you four signs, four symptoms that in case you're coming down with a case of redemption, that God is in work in your life, leading you to salvation, trusting him, repenting of your sins and putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And for those of us that have already experienced God's grace, we've already been saved. Begin to look and see if these things weren't true of your life. And how God worked in your heart to bring you to salvation and what you're experiencing today as a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. So with that being said, let's begin to look down in verse 1 of Acts chapter 9. Listen to what Luke records here. He says in verse 1, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, and in fact, that's their word, that that's what they described the early Christians, they were the way. Today, it happens to be a cult. And he says this, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, let me just stop there, because do you see the connection that Jesus is making to his church? It wasn't that Jesus referred to his church as a building. He wasn't referring it to as an it. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In other words, it kind of threw Saul off guard, because in the very next statement, he's going to say, who are you, Lord? In fact, he thought he was working for God instead of against God. And and now Jesus is making this connection of who he is and how he's interconnected. And here's what I want to say for us. That there are certain people that says, you know, I really love Jesus, but they marginalize their commitment to the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, how can we possibly say we love Christ, but we say, hey, you know what? I really don't like his bride. It would be like you inviting me on a Sunday afternoon for lunch after a service and saying, hey, we really like you, Pastor, but, but don't bring your bride. I mean, we, don't, we, we can't stand her. In fact, I would say it would probably be the reverse. You, you'd say, hey, we like your bride, but we, we don't like you, Pastor. And so Jesus is making that connection. He's telling us to, that, that when we look at church, we're not to marginalize it. We're not going to say we're not committed. And, and yet there's too many people in, in our country and our world that, that literally kind of push it off to the side. But, but God's wanting you to join it. God wants you to be a contributing member to it. God wants you to be involved in ministry. 
because he's connected to it. That's why he says, you're persecuting me. And folks, when we're not involved in church, I mean, I, I think it's a sin. I mean, there's no separation because Jesus calls the church, what? His bride. Look what he says down here as we read on in verse 5. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you're to do. In other words, as we begin to see the conversion of Saul, this was so significant, it's mentioned three times in the book of Acts. Right here in chapter 9, in chapter 22, when Paul addresses the people of Jerusalem, sharing his own testimony, and then Acts chapter 26, when he stands before King Agrippa. They're trying to find a charge to put him to death, but they find nothing but a squabble between Christians and Jews. And so here in that particular chapter in Acts 26, there's a phrase right after it says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he goes on, he says this, it's like you're kicking against the goads. Now, let me just say this, when, when he uses that word goads, not goats, but goads, he's describing a stick with maybe some sharp nails at the very end. And so for a, a farmer of that day and time to plow a field, maybe with an ox or whatever, when, when an ox didn't move fast enough, there wasn't enough urgency to get the field plowed, that, that the farmer would literally take those goads and, and begin to kind of jab him in the back of the leg, and the ox would basically do what? He, he would kick back against it. Well, spiritually speaking, that's what Paul was doing when God began to work in his life. What were the goads that Paul was resisting? Well, first of all, there was the death of Stephen back in Acts chapter 7. It wasn't that he threw stones, but he was there supervising the death of the very first Christian that we know of in Scripture. And it may have been as he saw this guy die and, and, and how he lived for, for Jesus Christ, it, it began to bring conviction. Maybe it was the way that the Christians were looking at the prophecies of the Old Testament. And, and maybe he didn't see certain connections and, and it began to bring conviction. Or maybe when he brought him back to prison or he put some to death and, and he saw the joy that was in their heart. Those are the things that he was resisting and, and, and he was like saying, I'm not going to have any of that. And then verse 7 says here that the men who were traveling with him stood speechless hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Let me just say this. When it comes to conversion, there can be people that are lost just like you, sitting in the pews next to you, listening to the same sermons, listening to same Christian friends, reading the same books, and all they hear is noise, but you're hearing the voice of God drawing you to salvation in Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says, Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. I mean, here Saul being named as the very first king of the nation of Israel. And remember who he was. He was Saul. He was head and shoulders, the Bible says, above everybody else. They took him because of his physical, maybe, well-being. And here he was, the mighty Saul kneeling now at the very feet of Jesus Christ. This one who thought he had saw clearly the, the ways of God now being led because he's blind from spiritual sight. This guy that one time was seizing Christians and putting them in chains and dragging them off to prison is now being arrested by Jesus himself. The one that, that hammered and, and, and broke these followers of Jesus Christ was now being broken over the anvil of Jesus. In other words, soon Saul would change his name. Listen to me. He would change his name to Paul. You know what that meant? Small. So he's resisting, and he eventually becomes Paul the small, the mighty man that was rising in the ranks of the religious circles, now becomes Paul the small that we begin to see. Verse 10. It says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to a street called Straight at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praising. Now, you imagine the rejection that Ananias had for this assignment. 
It would be like God coming to us maybe 10, 12 years ago. Hey, I want you to go down to such and such a street and, and you'll find a guy in a long robe and a, a, a turban on his head and, and a beard kind of like the Duck Dynasty guys. And, and by the way, I, I want you to begin to disciple him and I want you to pray over him and lay your hands. And, and let me just tell you his name. His name is Osama bin Laden. I mean, that's what he was experiencing in his heart. Verse 12. And he had seen a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. I mean, Ananias says, I know who you're talking about. I mean, this guy doesn't come to somebody's house for Bible study and prayer. He comes to lead them off to prison. And then look what happens in verse 14. And here... He has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road to which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. Now, folks, that's the story of Saul's conversion. But what I want to do for the remainder of our time is I want to literally describe Four symptoms, four realization that, that God's drawing you. And, and maybe you've been here week after week and, and, and you've watched online, but you've never experienced God's grace in your heart. For those that have experienced, let, let, let's just look back and see if these four realizations, these signs that, that God has given us and, and, and helped us to come to Jesus Christ. So, so let's look at these. Number one, the first realization that, that God may be calling you into his family is that God has pre- has been pursuing you. God has been pursuing you. I mean, just like Saul, he was doing what? Resisting the call of God. And for some of us, have we been resisting? Something's been having. Maybe we've got questions about life. Maybe we've got questions about death or the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe we're asking the question, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Really, is life worth living for? And those are things that God's trying to draw you to get your attention so that he can show you the answer and offer you hope and offer you help. For some, it may be just the Christian that shows love to you. They are inviting you to church. They're praying over you. They're, they're, they're witnessing to you. And, and so you may be resisting that particular call that God places on your life. For, for others, it's just confirmed by the truths or confronted with the truths of the gospel. And you know that at the end of your life, it's just not going to end well. C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist literature professor at Oxford, came to Christ and He literally describes that he was the most reluctant Christian of all times. I mean, he did everything to try to escape what God was doing in his heart before he ever surrendered. Now, we may not like to hear that, but that's who he was. He was just defining that he tried to push against and resist the very call of God to salvation on his life. He goes on, he writes a series of books called The Chronicles of Narnias and does several movies, or they do several movies based on those books. And and one of those, probably my favorite, is The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. In that particular book, he, he describes a little boy by the name of Eustace. And Eustace now has kind of a hard heart. He is in rebellion, and he eventually becomes a dragon, and he really wants to escape being a dragon. He wants to become a little boy. And Aslan, who happens to be the lion in the movie, who is a representation of Jesus Christ, leads him to a fountain of pure water to kind of bathe in, to soak in. And, and some literary, uh, literary scholars will say this is actually a description of what was going on in C.S. Lewis's life. I want you to just listen to a couple of things from, from that book. He said, The water was as clear as anything, and I thought I could get in there and bathe at it with the ease of pain. But the lion, Aslan, told me I must undress first. So I started scratching myself. 
My scales began coming off all over the place. And then I scratched a little deeper. Instead of just scales coming off here or there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully. In a minute or two, I just stepped out of it. I could see it lying there beside me looking rather nasty. It was the most lovely feeling, so I started to go down into the well for my bath. But just as I was going to put my feet into the water, I looked down and saw that the skin on my feet was all hard and rough and wrinkled and scaly, just as it had been before. It says that Eustace goes on and basically repeats the process a second time and a third time, growing increasingly despair. And, and the Bible, I mean, the, the, the story says that the lion said, you'll have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws. I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything that I ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. When he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than all the others had been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like much of that much, for I was very tender underneath now that I had no skin on, and threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. And that it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone. And then I saw why. I turned into a boy again. I wonder for how many of us it's a painful process. I'm saying that when God draws us into his kingdom, that he pursues us is not for punishment. It's not the reality that God hates you, but it's the reality that God loves you. In other words, He's not trying to pay you back for all your deeds, evil deeds. He's trying to literally bring you back because He's created you in your own image. So the first thing that we see, the first sign, the symptom, is that God's pursuing you. But there's a second sign, a second realization that God is pursuing you and, and God's drawing you to Himself, and that is you've been blind. You've been blind. I mean, Paul's blindness was given as a picture of every person that's been separated from Christ. Can, can I just say this? When you think about being blind, th there are two kinds of blindness. There's, there's that irreligious blindness, and then there's that religious blindness. Let, let's talk about that irreligious blindness. It, it's the reality that, you know what, I believe that my way is better than God's way. I, I just know what's best for me. I can make my own decisions. And when you begin to do that, you pursue a life of sin. You know what the middle letter in sin is? It's I. God, I, I want to do this. God, I, I want to do that. I don't want you really a part of my life. And, and so there's that reality that, that I'm in charge and I'm better than God. Somehow we think that we make better God than, than God actually is. And, and for a while, let me remind you that, that, that sometimes sin can be fun. But over a period of time, what happens is there's a string of broken relationships there's the reality that you're unhappy, and then finally you realize that, you know what, I'm blind. God's not really my enemy, even though I make him out to be my enemy. He's my friend trying to draw me into the kingdom of God. So first of all, there's that irreligious blindness. But, but here's what Paul had. Paul had that second form of blindness, that, that religious blindness. In other words, he thought he was good enough to earn God's approval. If he just tried hard enough, if he could just keep the rules good enough, then God was going to do what? He was going to accept it. Can, can I give you a quick Literally, a uh, theology lesson, you and I are spiritually dead. And because we're spiritually dead, our love for God has actually died. And what has happened is that we've allowed all kinds of things to creep into our lives that we find more important than God himself. John Calvin, one of the great preachers of years and years ago, he says, the human heart is like an idol factory. In other words, we're constantly coming up with things that basically matter more to us than God himself. And so I just wonder for 
us that when we think about our own spiritual blindness is that that we're dead we have no love for God but but there's a second aspect that you've got to think about when when you stand before God religiously blind you're naked before God you stand naked, there's that shame, there's that guilt, there's something wrong in your heart. And let me just ask you, what do you do when you feel naked? I mean, you began to kind of seek clothes, and, and, and the clothes that you began to seek for, for a lot of individuals is, is good works. You think somehow if, if I do this and I do that and I, I just pull myself up by my spiritual bootstraps, then, then, then God might be pleased. You know what that is? That's self-righteousness. And Charles Spurgeon tells of a young guy, a farmer that was dirt poor. He grew onions and carrots. And one day he had a carrot that was about four and a half feet long, and he thought, hey, I'm going to take this to the king. And so he goes into the presence of the king. He says, king, you're so worthy, and, and I just love my king. He, here's a gift from you from my own garden. And the king looked at it, kind of impressed and amazed, and he said, hey, you know what? I own all the other farms around you. I'm going to give those to you. Well, there happened to be a nobleman that was also there in the palace, and he said, if the king can be impressed with a carrot, imagine what he would be impressed if, if I could bring him a horse. And so the next day, he begins to try to find the best horse in all the land, and he finally walks in to the presence of the king with this good horse, and, and he says, king, you're just so worthy of, 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 of who you are, and I just have a love, and I want to give you this horse. And he was expecting something big in return from the king, and the king says, hey, the farmer brought a carrot yesterday and you bring me a horse because of your own self-righteousness i mean you see how that works sometimes we think we've got to impress god we got to do something better and let me remind you that in contrast to to good works there's the gospel it's a gift of god's grace he pays the penalty for our sins. He dies in our place. He clothes us with His righteousness. He gives us the resurrection of new life and a new heart. We say it this way, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is all about. It changed Paul's heart. Let me just ask you, when you think about God's grace and you experience it, I mean, you are in a sense of wonder, not entitlement. I mean, it would have been easy for Paul says, yeah, of course you prove of me. I'm a lot better than those other folks. But that's not what Paul says. He says, I experienced God's grace. John Newton simply writes as an elderly man, and in his old age, he says, as an old man, by this point, I thought I'd be different. Always love to pray, not jealous, not controlled by money. Love for God has sometimes gone cold you know what sometimes we become the biggest disappointments to ourselves and so we try harder we look deeper inside and you know what it, it can't come from inside it's got to come from the outside in fact john newton goes on he says the reason god allows us to continue to struggle all of our life with indwelling sin is that he wants us to grow ever more amazed at his grace i mean let me just ask you what is the ultimate test for spirituality for some people, it's, it's coming to some type of spiritual perfection with the spiritual fruit. Uh, look at how patient I, I've gotten over the years. Look at how much time I spend in God's Word. Look at how much uh, time I spend in, in prayer or how long I can offer a prayer or, or, or share the Christ with somebody. Folks, that's not what filled Paul's heart. His heart was filled with a wonder that God could even save him. And he reminds us that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, he says, of whom? I am chief. There's a, a wonderment about God's grace. There's also a transparency when we experience grace. I mean, he was always, Paul, listen to me, he was always admitting his faults. 
He couldn't believe how chief of a sinner he was. And, and he says, the law says not to covet. And he says, then I go out and covet. I, I, I'm trying to, to break the flesh, but the more that I try to break away from the flesh, the, the more I do what the flesh desires. Paul wasn't wrapped up with impressing people because he didn't want people to admire him in the flesh. He wanted people to run to his Savior. Folks, like I've told you before, I'm just one beggar trying to tell another beggar where to find food. And as a result, Paul became one of the most gracious and generous individuals we'll ever find. The guy that writes 1 Corinthians 13 about love. Really, we hear it quoted oftentimes in marriages, and not anything about marriage, but, but he reminds us that love is patient, love is kind, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Who, who wrote that? Wants a murderer. And then he writes in Romans chapter 9 that he wishes he could literally be punished for other people's sins so they could experience salvation. I mean, the one guy that put him in chains, the one guy that drug him to prison was now saying, hey, I wish I could go to hell for you so that you could be saved. We've all been blind. But here's a, a third thing that, that God does in our heart. A, a third thing that, that is a realization that, that God's uh, worked in our lives or maybe working in our lives. Uh, this is it. Your past doesn't disqualify you from God's grace. Your past doesn't disqualify you from God's grace. I mean, who was most impressed that Paul, the murderer, the persecutor, became preacher and eventually missionary? It had to be Ananias. You see, when real grace is experienced, we got to understand it's scandalous. I've already mentioned John Newton to you. He, he was a slave trader before he ever became a Christian. And when he thought about him doing it voluntarily and freely and destroying people's lives, he said, I can't believe that was who I was. So we think, Something in our past will disqualify us from God's grace. You you know what is most difficult for people to believe about the gospel? Let me just give you two statements. That you're so bad that Jesus would have to die to save you. And that Jesus was so gracious that he gladly died in your place. You're so bad that... Jesus had to die in order to save you, but he was so gracious that he willingly died in your place. What is the offense there? Do we struggle more with the reality that we're so bad that Jesus would have to die for us? In other words, does hell offend you? And if it does, you don't realize how worse you actually are. Folks, we've got to come to the realization that I'm worse than I ever dreamed of, but God is more gracious than I ever hoped for. So your past doesn't disqualify you from God's grace. But here's the fourth thing. Your past doesn't disqualify you from future use. Your past doesn't disqualify you from future use. I mean, here's God taking the greatest enemy of the church and making him the greatest missionary in the church. This guy that has blood on his hands of God's people, puts him before kings, allows him to share salvation to the world. Folks, you and I need to remember that God takes this this great enemy of the church, and he makes him into the greatest missionary of the church. And you may be thinking, how can God possibly use me? I mean, if he knows I've been divorced three times, how could God use me? I've been in adultery. I've been in drugs. I've had an abortion. Whatever it might be. And we think, you know, it has disqualified us from future use in the kingdom of God. Folks, nothing disqualifies you because God's grace is amazing. So like John Newton writes, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. As I close this morning, can, can I just speak, first of all, a couple of questions to us? Uh, number one, l- let me address the church. 
Those of you that are part of this faith family, let me ask you, have you lost the wonder of God's grace? I mean, have you become an Ananias thinking that somehow there's some soul that you quit praying for because you think they're beyond the grace of God? Have you just lost the wonder of God's grace? Have you lost the amazement of God's salvation? How often do you reflect that God would save a sinner like you? Like I said, we're far worse than we possibly could imagine. But God is more loving and gracious than we could ever hope for. If we've lost that amazement, then can, can I remind you that the angels in heaven rejoice every time someone comes into the kingdom of God? I mean, they just mar- they've just they been before the king thousands of years, the, 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 the creator of this universe, and they worship him. And the one thing they marvel at more than anything is God's amazing grace. And then for you that maybe you've been watching, I mean, you've been convicted, you, you're here, and, and maybe for the very first time, things begin to kind of make sense. But you're unsure where you stand before God. You, you're not sure what will af- actually happen when you die, if He's going to accept you. And, and the reality is, now you begin to see that, that God's been pursuing you. He's put people in your path, people that are praying for you, people that are sharing the gospel with you. You realize that you've been blind, and it may be religious blindness because you think somehow I can earn or merit or work for the favor of God. Some of us may be irreligious. I've been doing it my way for so long and think I make a better God than God actually makes. The reality is that you know that you're blind, that you are a wretch, that Jesus Christ has come to save. Let me just ask you, do you believe that Jesus can actually save you, that he has a plan for your life? Uh, Four symptoms, four signs that God's working in your heart to draw you to himself. Four signs that ought to be true of every follower of Jesus Christ if we've experienced his amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we thank for being a God who still saves, still rescues, still loves. And you do it freely. You do it because you know we can't save ourselves. I said, God, there there may be some that are listening right now. They, they, They know that you've been pursuing them and they're kicking, they're resisting that call to salvation. And today they they really want to offer this prayer. They they want to say, God, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus Christ came into this world to die for my sin. That he has saved me from my sins. And God, today I'm ready to receive that forgiveness. And I surrender my heart, my life to him. For those of us that have been a part of the church of Jesus Christ, may may we quit looking on the inside for our salvation because grace comes from the outside. May we always go back to the cross. And if we've lost our amazement and our wonder at salvation, God, bring it freshly back to our minds and our hearts. Allow us to see you anew of what you've done for us and how you shed your blood on the cross so that we could have eternal life. So God, I just ask that you just draw us closer that you would help us not to be like Ananias, but you would help us to be willing and ready to go to our souls and share the good news of Jesus Christ. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to thank you for joining us today. We hope this has blessed you in a special way. If you missed the beginning of this video or would like to watch it again, you can find this video on Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, and our website. As always, please let us know how we can help you and your family, especially during this difficult time. Our office number is 334-396-9376. We hope that you have a blessed day.